on the second day of Christmas. Did you pour your beer yet? No, I was singing. I got to sing. That's my bit. This year's second beer of Christmas is Great Northern Porter from Summit Brewing Company in St. Paul, Minnesota. In this video, we talked to brewery founder Mark Stutrud about the risk of releasing a porter in the mid 80s as the style had gone nearly extinct, how this beer won the respect of the beer hunter Michael Jackson, and Mark Stutrud hooks us up with his recipe for six pack porter beef carbonade. The 12 Beers of Christmas is brought to you with ongoing support from BSG Handcraft, Imperial Yeast, and the Patreon supporters of Chop and Brew. Join them at patreon.com slash chop and brew. On the second beer of Christmas, my brew love gave to me <laughs> Summit Great Northern Porter in a can with this guy, El Jefe, Mr. No. Mark Stutrud, coming back at y'all. Real quick, before we kind of talk about the beer, the story I really wanted to gift myself and I wanted to have you kind of tell people, um, it has to do with this photo on the wall behind me. I consider you, you're, you're canon in my house, Mark Stutrud. You're on the wall with a picture of, of St. Arnold and my wedding picture and my beagle in Texas and the blue bonnets. You are photographed Fairly younger age with the beer hunter Michael Jackson in the original Summit Brewery location in St. Paul. That is an awesome picture. I imagine that was an awesome moment. Absolutely. What was he doing? But I have to say, I'm, okay. I'm, I'm, I have to say, I'm thankful that um, there aren't any sacred candles glowing around that that portrait. <laughs> that that would freak me out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's no, there's no um, voodoo doll. There's no voodoo doll. <laughs> so, you know, that uh, moment in time was very phenomenal for me. When you think of a peak experience, um, being a new brewer, and we're talking about being a new brewer in 1986, when they were far and few between, scattered across the country. Michael Jackson happened to been, he had to be in town uh, in uh, November of 86, just a handful of weeks um, after we opened up. And he was a curator of beers. He was a consultant for um, a restaurant group that owned Kincaid's and they had just opened up Kincaid's in Bloomington. And uh, he was there for the grand opening and Kincaid's was one of the first 10 draft beer accounts that we had after we started. And to meet Michael Jackson at Kincaid's and then have him come over to the brewery um, the next day, and then spend the full day with me where we went to W.A. Frost, Sweeney's, Johnny's Bar, <laughs> a handful of places. We spent the whole day, took him back to his hotel that night. We hit all of, well, we only had to hit nine other accounts because he had already been to one. Um, but you know, it was, um, I, I'm so blessed to have been able to bump into somebody like that and to uh, consider Michael Jackson a friend and someone who had come back to St. Paul many times and, and visit the, to visit us. So miss him dearly. He really embraced the porter. Um, you know, we, the extra pale ale, as I've said in the past, um, that that really took people by surprise. They didn't know what to think. And then within uh, two, three months, we come out with something that's black and opaque. 
the style that typically someone wouldn't go up and buy as just a trial. To put on a porter was really extremely risky. In fact, at that time, we were only one of five breweries in the entire world that produced an authentic traditional porter. It's crazy when you think about that today, because <laughs> you know, you've got peanut butter, you've got raspberry jam, you've got peach, you've got... Yep, vanilla, for sure. Yeah. Grandma's socks. I don't know. I, you know, but anyway, um, to think about the fact that this style almost went extinct. That's another reason I think why Michael Jackson really embraced us because we truly were very, and we still are. I mean, we, we know our soul. Um, I love it when people criticize me for being classical and traditional because I say, shit, you've been paying attention. You've been paying attention to what I've been doing or what we've been doing for 35 years. Because understanding an arpeggio actually gives you an idea of what key you should play in. without understanding the classic foundation of music, you really have no point of reference. And, you know, I love Frank Zappa, you know. <laughs> he, was totally, he was totally experimental. He was off the wall, but he had a foundation in people like Eric Dolphy and a number of other jazz folks. But I love it when I think about styles of beer and styles of music and experimentalism and I'm going, you know, Miles Davis and those dudes, they spent a lot of time in the studio before they did the final cut of Kind of Blue. They knew their shit. <laughs> and they knew their shit really. So going back, I don't forsake foundation and tradition in the classics because that's what everybody should really understand. And again, going back to Great Northern Porter, it's a, uh, a style of, of itself that was uh, damn near one extinct because of the popularity of stout, mm. but it was a working man's drink. It started out as a blend of black ale and pale ale, and then eventually morphed into something that was, you know, not high in ABV. It wasn't heavy in body, and it had a pretty much a bittersweet finish, something very quaffable. And to have this medium bodied, you know, foreboding black beer in front of you, you know, that was a challenge to uh, Midwest beer drinkers in 1986, but, you know, thank God they suffered through it. <laughs> but you went for it. What was your idea when you said, we're just gonna do this, we're gonna put this porter, was it the idea of kind of staying true to a tradition? You're like, this is the mission statement, or was it to kind of, um, more to open eyes to this style and to tell the story, which can be like a very laborious task when your main concern is selling beer, right? All of the above. Mm -hmm. I agree with everything you said, Chip. But yes, um, again, coming out of the shoot with EPA back in 86, that was a big risk in a lot of people's minds. I mean, there were people who just looked at me and said, good luck, good luck on that. And, um, you know, making money was a secondary thought after survival. 
but literally, truthfully, I started I started the brewery with the intent of educating people about classical styles, elevating the appreciation of beer that we lost through prohibition that folks in Europe and England never was disconnected with. And also with the idea that we would get to a true beer culture. And in some ways, um, that mission is still very true today. What should you have been brewing? What would they, what were those people saying? Like macro or something still in the ale world, but just not as, as bitter? Oh, Another Irish well, red? I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah. The uh, Coors Irish red was still a, a small part of sales. Um, when we started up, I think the entire Twin Cities area maybe had 10 draft lines of Guinness, maybe four of uh, Anchor Steam. Um, it, was, it was pretty slim pickings in terms of getting down to styles of beer. So what can I say? I mean, being a hard-headed Norwegian, being stubborn kind of helps. Yeah. to kind of, you know, muddle through some of this stuff. To uh, go back to your perspective, your original question, uh, you know, there wasn't a beer wholesaler that would touch us with a 10-foot pole the first year we were in business. We self-distributed. We had to out of survival. And when we would talk to these distributors, and we would give them a sample of the extra pale ale and then the porter, they'd go, aren't you going to make a light beer? And I said, no, that already exists. We're, this is, you know, and diversity wasn't a word that was like in people's uh, vocabulary at the time. So, I mean, it really was, uh, cutting edge in so many ways of like, you know, you know, we couldn't point to the uh, Samuel Smith's pale ale that was collecting dust on the shelves because it was nine bucks a six pack. And uh, there were people that were drinking bass ale, Samuel Smith's, a handful of German beers, Belgian beers, absolutely. But when we got to getting to the point of getting into the business, we looked at the price points of Canadian and Mexican imports. But Canadian and Mexican imports were basically a part of that typical lager genre that was so common. And we wanted to be really distinct and set ourselves apart with no money, no marketing budget. <laughs> what so can do I you guys say? use real peanuts or do you use that like PB2 peanut butter powder? <laughs> no, really, tell, tell me about the beer. Tell me uh, I, I, I prefer the extract oil. Oh, yum. Mm. Fake peanut butter. Um, yeah, just tell me a little bit why, uh, it's, why it's been around more than 30, 35. Where are we? Where are y'all at? Yeah. yeah, next year I turn 35, man. Man. So, um, you know, again, um, it's all about taste. And people's uh, flavor preferences move around. It's one of the reason why one of the reasons why our pilsners have really taken off. Because um, folks are going in that direction. There are people drinking seltzers. There's 
so much we can talk about. But when it comes to a porter, it is a, um, as I said before, it, it, it's a lighter body, it's medium bodied, it's not quite, someone would say as heavy as a stout, but it's got this bittersweet finish to it that's really very refreshing. Obviously during the summer months, you know, some folks will lighten up and not be in this direction. So we're going to have this as a seasonal moving forward. Okay. I was happy to see it in Canada but, when I saw that when I saw that fall time box. I had never seen GNP in a can. It was awesome. I I know. It's um it's a beautiful it's a lot of fun, but you know what? The the design of the can and you know you got the capital on there. Mm -hmm. And you also have that train motif below the capital. Mm -hmm. At Johnny's Bar. <laughs> and this was during market research. This was before um, the brewery was even fired up across the street from Johnny's Bar. A close friend of mine, Ron Cruz, who was working with me uh, doing interviews and surveys with uh, bar owners and managers about, you know, the styles of beer that we should do. And, and we're sitting at Johnny's and I don't know what the hell we're drinking that night, but it was beer. I know that for sure. But probably imported. We decided to uh, do a porter and my, my uh, grandfather worked for James J. Hill for the Great, Great Northern Railway. And so it was the, the brand name is a play on words of a Great Northern Porter because it was the working man that back in London, working on the docks, the rail yards that were drinking porters back before stouts became prevalent. And we thought, what, what a great name, Great Northern Porter. It was fueled by beer. What can uh -huh. I say? <laughs> And you said porters at one point were a pale and a black ale? Just to have like a third it, option? It was a blue. What's that? Just to have like a third option available kind of instead of brewing a third beer? Like, hey, let's just blend this and there's another oh. option. Well, exactly. It's like if, uh, if you had a black ale, it may have been seasonal. Uh, and if you had a pale ale, or an IPA or something else. This was, it started out as a blend. Hmm. That's very interesting. From what I know, from what I know. Don't quote us on that internet. No, well, I mean, there's plenty of, uh, plenty of stories out there, so. I want to ask you, do you like to cook with this beer? Or do you like carbonade? What's that? Carbonade. Beef carbonade. Ooh. I will take a six pack of porter, three pounds of sirloin cubed, you know, tossed with the traditional flour, salt, and pepper in a Ziploc. Brown that in a Dutch oven. Add probably somewhere close to three pounds of onions, about um, six or eight large yellow onions that have been thinly sliced. Put that into the Dutch oven. And, and, and that's actually, re you've removed the beef, right? You've, you brown the beef, you throw it in a bowl, a bowl, you add some more butter in there, a little bit of olive oil, put all your onions that are in there and 
get the onions and then you're scraping the bottom as you're pouring some porter in there, throwing in a bunch of thyme and bay, a little bit more salt, put the beef back in and you just simmer that for, yeah. I like to do it for about three hours under low heat. And for me, I like it when all the onions almost just like dissolve. <laughs> With the six pack of porter that you poured on top of all that stuff. Probably show my ignorance. Then do you just eat that with like a spoon or do you put that on a big piece of bread? Do you just eat it like a stew? Egg noodles. Ooh. Egg noodles, yeah. Oh, okay. Almost, I mean, not the same, but almost Egg. like a sauerbraten treatment yeah. in a German version. Well, see, and that's the other, you know, that's the other, uh, the finishing touch is you hit it with uh, a little bit of balsamic vinegar yeah, and some uh, blackberry uh, preserves. I thought you were going to say very brandy. End. I thought you were going to say blackberry no, brandy. No, black <laughs> mm, no. Six pack of porter, uh, three shots of blackberry brandy. Well, that would work. I mean, it would volatize the alcohol. Yeah. That would work. I want to make this. Now I want COVID to be over so we can, like, shoot this video at your house. Oh, so I'll, uh, I'll send you some cliff notes on that. But it's like, uh, yeah. Mm. I really like to reduce the onions to where... They actually dissolve into the gravy. Sue doesn't like that so much because she still <laughs> likes to have the texture of the onion. But so I can throw some onions in the last half hour. Well, I love that. I should have mentioned when we first started talking, like the picture of you, and Michael Jackson. You're holding big ass mugs of this beer. That's you had said not to be self braggadocious, but you had said that he said it was one of the best examples of a porter in the world and that coming from the beer hunter. I know you weren't gonna drop that nugget, but I yeah. wanted to make sure that was noted. Boom. Well, yeah, I mean, I mean, the uh, crazy ass thing about that is we had only been selling beer for about four months. I mean, obviously we had worked on the uh, you know, the formulation, the process of producing the beer at the brewery for several months before that. But I mean, like I said, it was a peak experience to have someone who at that point in time had very strong opinions and positions about the quality and style uh, of beer and and then he selects us. I mean, that was, that was pretty huge. The funny thing about it is if you can imagine if we had social media back then, the ripple effect of that, I didn't even have an effing fax machine. <laughs> when Michael Jackson was at the brewery. I know. You know, it was, about, it was about eight months after that, Chip, when I found out that Ted Marty at August Shells in New Ulm had a fax machine, I thought, shit, I'd better get one. <laughs> oh, forget the Joneses. I got to keep up with the Martys. <laughs> I mean, it, back then it was it was Ted Marty and us and yep, Line and Googles, but they were already bought by Miller. So I mean, it was like it was, but you know, yeah, no. Ted said, "Yeah, Stott Rude, you should get a fax machine." So then he can talk to distributors. I go, really. <laughs> well, I'm glad you stuck it out. I'm glad you took the road to enlighten the masses. Mark Stuttrude. Well, thank you. Mm. Well, that's the second beer of Christmas, everybody. 
I don't know what the third one is yet. I haven't shot it, but it won't be with Mark. <laughs> All right, Mark. Happy holidays. Thanks for hanging. You yeah. can stick around. Love you. Gonna Thank you. I'm just going to stop rolling video at this point, though. Merry Christmas!